Yeah, all well, about leadership here on a given Monday morning or afternoon here on Think Tech. And we're talking about architecture, as in humane architecture, Martin Despang's show on Tuesday afternoon. And uh, we're comparing the elements of architecture as a reflection of, of our world today. And, and it's true, architecture is an expression not only of art, but of humanity, of society, of our world. If you snapshot architecture through the ages, you see it, it reflects, usually accurately reflects how things were going. And so today we're gonna take a look at classical architecture uh, and we'll, we'll look at uh, what we call cynical architecture, cynical classical architecture, and see what that represents, how it is happening and what it represents about the direction of the world in general and leadership, especially leadership, because the government always has a lot to do with architecture, big capital, investment and in infrastructure, has a lot to do with the way architecture and buildings come out. And for this discussion, you know, our hero in architecture, uh, professor at the School of Architecture here at UH, uh, and our host of Humane Architecture, uh, Martin Despang. Applause, please. Mm. I didn't thanks hear for having me, <laughs> Jay, I appreciate it. Even though this is sort of a, well, thanks for having me on the other side of the table as a guest, although the reason for this is not so uh, funny as, uh, no. you know, we we will talk about. So bring up the first slide, please. And I was trying to remember when it was the last time when I was on the other side as a guest, and that was with Tim Apicella, who took on with you to report weekly about what our government and our leader is doing. It's called Trump Week. Yeah. And we thought the news that Trump wants all federal buildings to be of classicist style so the obviously nickname is like Trump wants to make architecture classicist again, made us get all our existing or non-existing hair get up uh, and wanting to do a show at Trump week. But Trump week is at the end of this, this week. And so we thought this requires more immediate action. So here we are. So I was at Tim's show four years ago. This is quoting the show. We were talking about a project a topic, which is transportation, which is another very, very hot topic on our island, this is public transportation, this is sort of light rail because it's underground, all the things we're not doing here on the island, right? And little did I know that maybe, you know, we could have talked about this project also in the context we want to talk about today, classicism. So let's quickly recap and use Google what classicism is per definition, which is stated here. Okay. The style comprises a range of conventional forms, notably columns, known as orders, each with fixed proportions and ornaments, especially Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian. Proportion, symmetry, and the relationship of individual parts to the whole also characterize classicism. And if you go to the next slide, what I will talk about what characterizes democracy is freedom. And this project came out of a competition. So you have a non-corruptible jury and that awards what I think is the best, no matter what style or what party you belong to. We won this competition in 2001, and it took a dozen of years to be completed. And the next slide is basically me having gone back to my native culture over the break and visited my sons and their girls and our capital in Berlin. And at the bottom right, you see one of my heroes in architecture, that's Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. He was kicked out by this other guy dictating way worse things than style, but that too, and kicked uh, Mies out of the country, and then luckily we here in the United States got him. This is one of his latest, last projects, the National Gallery at the very bottom right. It's currently being uh, remodeled by someone who admires Mies, and that is David Chipperfield. David Chipperfield just completed a... Uh, the, the Simon uh, Gallery, which you see at the bottom left, and you see up there a book that I think I gave you a copy once. There was Charm that we were published next to what well, I look up to, which is Chipperfield. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide and let's quickly look how Chipperfield is is sort of implementing constructively critical classicism. You see the or, or the old building on the right, and when he remodels that, he takes the very ornated columns and simplifies that. So the column, the second from the right is sort of the remodeled uh, column. When he adds to that, which is the left part, he totally purifies to the most extreme. 
And next slide is a, uh, is a model picture because, again, democracy, this was an architectural competition in 2007. It took another, you know, uh, decade to basically complete. And the water in front of that, that's interesting because that's a little sort of a canal that's in front of that. And on the other side of that, guess what? There is our German Ma-a-Lago. And we go to the next slide, and I know you're very interested in that topic. Yes. Okay. We talked yes. about this before the show, so yes. share with me your reaction. Well, it looks like Mar-a-Lago. This uh, it's um, it's uh, it's what, what's the uh, it's ersatz. Uh, that's that maybe that's an overuse of the term, but it's ersatz. Um, and uh, I mean Mar-a-Lago is this is the original, uh, and, and Mar-a-Lago is the ersatz. And you told me that uh, Angela Merkel has uh, her apartment here. She lives in this building. Hence the policeman out in front. Um, so what does this building tell you on a, you know, on a classical basis? What does it tell you? You know, it's, it's a historic building, it's classicist, but more importantly, again, it's democracy behind styles, architectural styles, because she is not an owner, she's a renter in there. And uh, recently she was inspired by young people who said, you know, I don't think our generation is listening to politicians anymore. And she said, well, let's get this going. And she started a little bed and breakfast at the bottom of the place that she's running with her with her uh, professor husband up there, right? So she's living downtown, she's living in a very humble way, and, and that's that's a symbol for democracy rather than being sort of the emperor who lives in a big castle, right, of pathetic nature, which we're going to talk about further on the, the down the road. Right? Well, what, what, is, what, what is the difference between this building and Mar-a-Lago? I mean, in terms of architectural elements, and in terms of its faithfulness to true classicism? Well, as, I mean, stylistically, I guess we leave this up for historians, but I think, you know, this is an urban building. Trump's big thing is a suburban thing. This is climatically appropriate because this is wall architecture. There's a stamp of climate, so it has, you know, thick walls and, and few windows. Trump's thing is in the tropics. It shouldn't be hermetic, right? So right. this one is right, the other one is wrong. Let's right. just say that. Right, right. And let's go to the next slide, because talking about wrong, you know, we have these very dark days where where Hitler was prescribing, ironically, sarcastically, the same style. And then his architect, Albert Speer, you see at the bottom right, was coming up with these megalomanic visions of supersize everything and everything in that kind of old style. And while on the left side is the brighter side, which DeSoto always, you know, pokes me and says, you guys have started this nudism thing. And so the architecture that you see up there is Gropius in 1926 with a Fargus factory where he was about modern. It was about democratic, bringing light and air to the people, Carter of Athens, right, all these things. So both things I have, you know, as a baggage, obviously, in my culture, both the, the bad and the good. And the next slide is how I deal with that. This is a project from our firm. It's a public building. There we go again. It's not federal, but it's, it's a state building. It's a state school building. And I was once giving a lecture, a, a guest talk at the nearby when I was still in the prairie at K-State, and the colleague said his TA made this poster. And he couldn't resist to make this reference to the Third Reich at the top left. Next slide. My, one of my mentees became a writer, and he was a little bit more mild. He called this article that he wrote about at the dining temple out of concrete, and he refers to the very <coughs> sort of initiating style of classicism is the Greek and the Mormon architecture with a sort of similar kind of syntax, but more importantly, a very civic nature. I mean, this is architecture for the people, right? right. Which Trump's Mar-a-Lago is not. That's just for him, for him or, the, or the few rich people. Oh, by the way, in, in Angie's Bread and Breakfast, you can you can sign up for that. Everyone can. Of course, they do some security check, but it's for very little money. You can live with a with a president and talk. Isn't that great? It is great. It, as you say, very democratic, and that and that's the nature of um, of true classicism. Um, you know, to be open to the people, to be the people's place. Um, exactly. Yeah, and and so you're right. And you take the same elements and you put them in a, a very private place, only for a few rich people. You're violating the spirit of classicism as as originally as it originally existed in in Greece and Rome. Absolutely. You kind of gentrify it, right? And if we go to the next slide, this is our talking heroes. Thank you for the nice words. But my true hero is your 
uh, other host, um, you know, Howard Wig, Mr. Code Green, he's here. And we were once doing a show, we had the building as a demonstration of how you might want to build, you know, in, in this art climate and in my climate. And this building was probably the closest. If you take out the fixed glazing and replace it with jealousies, it would very much work here too. Um, it shades itself, and then it would be easy breezy, and it is friendly, as you can see. And in the temperate climate, it lets the sun beep in. This is a winter situation, and you got the, the young kids dating there, so how much more friendly could you be? So with that, Jay, you know, let's go back to our country and culture and the dilemma we're facing. You go to the next slide. And one, one last time going back, at the very bottom, the two pictures, this is how George W. Bush thought America should be represented with its embassy in the, you know, old and, and new capital of, of Germany in Berlin again. This is the American embassy. I always thought it's an embarrassment. It's, and I don't think that style was mandated, but the architects are actually nice architects. Do you remember Sea Ranch, your old hippie day, Jay, at the very middle to the left, you can see Sea Ranch. This mm -hmm. is an icon of hippie architecture. Mm -hmm. And I once was on a very memorable uh, spring break trip with a lovely mentee, and we gave a, a presentation at uh, what's now called a Moore Rubel Udell, and one of the principals proudly showed me pictures in the hallway of that project, the embassy, and I didn't know where you look at, because I find it pretty embarrassing, and the only good thing about it is at the top left that the facade is very good as a canvas that some people who want to voice their democratic opinion are projecting onto it, and this was projected when Trump pulled out of the, 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 the Paris Agreement. Uh. Total loser, so sad. So that was a projection of the public onto the building from the outside. Yeah. The top left one I pulled out because um, in the in the better days under Kennedy, where, by the way, I did some research, also they were thinking about that federal projects should be special and mandating some sort of standards, but they intentionally didn't describe the style. So this guy here at top left is Edward Durrell Stone. This is the uh, American Embassy in New Delhi, built in 1959. You know, you can call this neoclassical. I mean, you got all the elements, you know, everything about classicism. The top right, we have an Edward Durrell Stone building as well on UH. And unfortunately, then our uh, uh, university decided to jam this sort of horrible, I, we call it the microwave banana, in front of it, which is a modern building. So again, you know, style, as we we talking, doesn't mean good or bad, right? It's about your intentions and your talent. And talking about that, the next slide is probably the most shocking. And I have to thank my Yumi Hara, who was sensitizing me about the topic and we probably all are doing the show about this to her because she was sending this to me and she said this reminds her of the darkest moment of her death practice uh, back in the early 90s where a campus architect who is now still the principal of one of the biggest architectural firms on the island played trump and basically said the school of architecture building should be neoclassical in style and he said two other things one was ground for parking and the third one was central axis in the quad. And that killed what you see at the very bottom, John Hara's beautiful design, democratic design, moving the school of architecture out of this sort of pretty too strict sort of axis, moving it out of it, open the quad. And at the bottom right, you see he made a little sort of a canopy that was, you can call it classicist, postmodernism. That was in postmodernism at the peak of it, picked up. But he's a modernist, so he interpreted it, and, but he was shut down by the by the Trump of our university at that time, and now we're left with that piece of pathetic pomo cake, right? Yeah, from well, the School of Architecture, that. much less. <laughs> exactly, and I, I boycott. I don't teach in there because I teach Easy Breezy in other buildings, and, and, and Austin Paul Saunders Hall, which is an Easy Breezy Brutalist. People might not like Brutalist building, and this is, reminds me also of Prince Charles was another one who was trying to do something with what Trump is doing right now, and he was lobbying against modernism and brutalism. But again, there is no, there is no, you know, bad or good. It's just how you do it. And go to the next slide. We, I uh, was thinking about our most classicist architect in the best sense uh, on our island, and this is someone who is going to be, who's with us in many shows <laughs> in the recent past and in the future. This is Ronald Lindgren. 
uh, with his partner Edward Killingsworth. And the buildings at the top are references to shows with the Kahala Hotel, the Seaside um, United Airlines Hotel. Uh, last three shows were by Harvard Square. His uh, Kapalua Hotel on Maui, which shame on the people who were privately, you know, again, reactionists, tore it down. And I was sharing here what Ron had sent me recently. This is what looks the most classic. This is what should have been the case study house number 26 in the, in the legendary case study house. And again, once again, a very democratic, a very fresh, a very American in its best sense of the word. You know what strikes me as a German, as an Americano, is of course, you know, our ancestors came here mainly from Europe with the wagon trains and all they knew and how they built when they were built was what they remembered from way back, right? Mm -hmm. The old European style. Yeah. But then postmodernists basically came and said, oh, we need our first own style. And never mind, they stole it from the Italians or the Russian France, but they, they pretend that that's <laughs> the first truly American style, which I think is BS, excuse me, because modernism is the thing that once, you know, the new, Ameri the new you know, settlers had felt comfortable. They looked back at Europe and modernism had come up, and they basically, while uh, Germans lost the war, luckily, and were after that traumatized, the modernism became very stiff while Americans picked it up and made it fun. And I think this Killingsworth project, again, everyone in Germany looked up to the case study how serious back in the mid-century, that was the coolest, the best stuff, and everyone wanted to be like that. Mm -hmm. So it's... <laughs> go to the concluding slide, which is a compilation of many things. Um, this slide and the one about uh, the Zona and the Naked, I stole from the most ambitious show that DeSoto and I have been in the making for years now, and it will be about skins. It will be about the relationship of the first skin, the human skin, the second, the clothing we put over, and the third, the fenestrations, the windows we put around us. And we compare these. Uh, the, the, the very academic subtitle of the show will be Address Code, Address Code, so the relationship between, you know, you know, enclosures. So here you see obviously at the top right, well, start at the bottom left. There we see the guy who is trying to mandate classicism, and there is his castle, Mar-a-Lago. And how is he dressed? Well, his wife and his son, luckily, are sort of easy breezy dressed, but he's totally inappropriately dressed, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so are his buildings, and that's why we have to assume so will be what comes out of his mandate. Not that it's classicism that is bad, as I hopefully made my case, but that Trump made mandates it because I'm sorry, while his early buildings in New York City as a developer were sort of okay as modernism. But, uh, you know, recently, the way, what, the, tie, the, the ties he wears, and then in, he wears them too long, and the, the, the suit he wears, I'm sorry, there is a lack of sense of taste, and that's why I'm assuming the architecture he wants to mandate will be all the same. While our local boy, uh, Barrick, when he was running the country, and you see him at the top right back home, seems more appropriately to dress, right? Easy breezy. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and, and top left is we actually did a show, you might want to revisit that, guys. The story and I will look into the subject, sort of, and it was called Presidential Paradise slash Paradisal Presidents. And we went through each and every, well, not every, but, you know, significant presidents. And while obviously Reagan in the 80s had started the whole thing with a reactionary, but you see him at the top left um, after his presidency, stopping by in Hawaii with Nancy and taking a bath, and you know, were appropriately dressed for that. And we looked into that actually his architecture way back. The house he lived in was actually a modernist house still, and so you know, his, his architectural taste or mandate wasn't as bad as his political one. But now we have, you know, this gets more extreme and worse. Now we have someone who is political taste is really bad, and so will be his architectural one. And so I don't think, uh, Jay, it's, it shouldn't be in these days about style anymore, that S. There are two other S's that are important. The other one is solar. This traces back to our friend um, you know, Howard, to saying, you know, we have this energy crisis and global warming, and buildings contribute to the majority to that. So we should first and foremost not think about how buildings look like, but how they perform.
That's one thing. And the other big, I think, challenge is, and this is what the pictures refer to on the right side in the middle, this is where Obama just bought the former Magnum PI estate up, down in Waimanalo. And uh, this is going to be very challenging for him, although, you know, he's considered to be more democratic and more, you know, empathic in many ways. But there is what I call suburban uh, nomads trying to avoid the same homeless uh, encampment in front of his yard. And I'm sort of talking cynical or ironically or sarcastically, hoping that he hasn't while he has torn down the main mansion down, but he has kept the guest house. And this is where Thomas, you know, Magnum was scripted to live in, to crash in that little place. And he hopes he rents this out to suburban nomads, because otherwise you see the picture on the right. And I'm driving by there every other day. You see these, you know, flipped on the side cars. This is what happens. So this is the next, I think, big challenge architecture as you perfectly say doing nothing less but nothing more than portraying zeitgeist is to address these issues of being biophonetic and of being socially appropriate and i threw in at the very left from uh, ron lincoln again maybe the most relevant killingsworth projects amongst all the great work he's done on the island is this one here which is a solution for um new favelas in latin america way back which are very simple courtyard houses, we feel sympathetic with that because the picture to the right of that, the smallest picture, unfortunately, is a project we have in the making with the emerging generation that we call CCC, Cargo Courtyard Cabanas. And it's, it's shooting for the $3,000 home that then everyone could afford, especially the ones in need. And you line up what we call cargo steel to avoid, say, shipping containers in a row so that due to the all-American principle of buy one, get one free, you get the courtyard for free, and you can say they're all lined up in a row that looks very militaristic, and we can call that classicist. But again, it's very, it has an obligation. It's not about how it looks. It's about that it, you feel cool in there, and then it's affordable. That's what it is. And these are my more than, many more than two cents to this subject. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're so, talking about certain elements. Um, so I guess classicism are these columns. Um, but I think modern, from what you say, modern classicism would be uh, reminiscent of the columns, but it would be in an appropriate place, appropriately functional, um, and it would speak, again, to the people uh, rather than to some rich guys or some guys in power. And so what we have today under Trump is we have architecture that he encourages and builds Mar-a-Lago and elsewhere, including the government, I suppose, government buildings and the like, that are, that's classical, or um, I don't know the difference, neoclassical, uh, yeah. and it's cynical classical because it fails to, it fails to accurately represent the, the, the feeling at the time that class, classical architecture was developed, that is, that it belongs to the people, it's public space. It's all about public space, and public space is part of government. You know, if you want to have a decent government, you have to have public space, and the architecture, you know, can either do that or not. And so, you know, what, what I get out of this is um, um, we, you as architects, I would not include myself there, uh, you as architects, oh, you're, you're, you're observing what is going on. And you're saying, hmm, yeah. here's a building, let me evaluate it uh, from all of those points of reference and uh, anal analysis and see what, where it fits. Is this true classicism? Is it neoclassicism? Is it, is it cynical classicism? Is it Trumpian classicism? And then that will help us understand the way our society is working. Um, what, what I'm missing on that, and I hope you'll discuss it for a minute anyway, is how much influence the architect has on what the, you know, the capitalist, the capital concentration, or the government um, does. In other words, uh, you know, can the architect actually influence the design that is coming up. These are expensive projects. Um, you can go mm -hmm. to your client, so to speak. I'm sure you, you've done this and say, look, don't do it this way, do it that way. Do it democratically. Do it with liberty yeah. and you know, equality and justice and all that. And you can do that for him. You know how to do that for him. But if he says yeah. no, if he says no, Martin, or if Trump says no, and Trump would say no, uh, or if the government under Trump says no, where are you? You don't have influence on it. You can only be an observer and you can tell me and the world that this really doesn't measure up against the true standard of our, of our time. How, how far off am I when I say that to you? 
No, you're right on it. Again, I like to respectfully disagree. You're more architect than many of the architects I know here on the island. So let me tell you that, first of all. <laughs> Thank you. And then secondly, I think it's again, and I had the privilege to become American as well on top of my German nationality. So I, I would say, and I have to learn by heart, the, we the people, we the people, we the people, right? So as tragic as it might be, if he mandates, but he mandates only where he can. So what private developers do, he can't mandate. So I think it put, probably puts more pressure or responsibility on the private sector to step up to make up for the deficiencies we might be getting in sort of this prescribed architecture that the, that the private sector steps up. But that's, you know, they're not really living up to where they what they should. I mean, we keep talking about Kaka'ako and hard views and Kamehameha schools, right? Maybe then they should kick in and, and, and then do much better if, if the government sort of might, might, might fail on, on that sector. And when we hopefully again get, get a good government again, I hope that, you know, as coming full circle to the beginning, the best tool to basically institute good architecture no matter what kind of, um, I would say, you know, um, you know, the way it looks like, is again make, basing it on a democratic process. And the most democratic is, which is very common in uh, Europe, not very common in America, is a competition where you either have it open, you know, to everyone to apply to submit their proposals, and you have a jury that I said at the beginning is non-corruptible, right? And and they basically don't pick by name. They pick by what you so perfectly put by making sense in terms of the budget, the program. And, and in that way, in that way, they may have some influence. But let me close with exactly. uh, with this comment. Uh, you know, if I build a big public building and it's um, it's Ersatz classic classicism, if I build something that is not democratic, that is not for the people, that is not uh, an accurate reflection of our time. But is an attempt to uh, to do as in Mar-a-Lago to serve only a few people, the rich um, on the mm -hmm. other side, the other side of the equation, and that building has a useful life of a hundred or two hundred or three hundred years. My last question to you, Mar uh, Martin: uh, Doesn't that building have an adverse effect on us, our society, for the life of its its useful life? Um, it's telling us something. It's not what we want to hear, but it stands there as a monument to the wrong principles. Doesn't that hurt us? Doesn't that affect us for the life of the building? It certainly does, but let's just try to end on a positive note. Um, I, I think that's the good part of, of architecture is that, you know, it, it certainly survives and it embodies sort of its zeitgeist from the days, but you can see Wonderful conversions, for example, let's go back to my original native culture again, the, the big stadium in Berlin um, that, um, you know, I, I happened to be there and revisit it a few years ago over the summer, and that was built for the worst of ideology, for the worst of mankind you could think of, right? What Reich, what the Third Reich and Hitler embodies. And uh, it has then been converted successfully to an architectural competition uh, Gurkhan Machen partner, one of the you know um, big architects in 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 in, the, in Germany, have converted it in, into a beautiful well, arena. So there you, like there the you have it. There you have it, Martin. I think and, that's and, the, and, the and, takeaway and, and, of and, all and, of this is that you when, can convert the building, you can convert yeah. the building, and thus the message of the building. In fact, to go back to our title, all about leadership, you can convert the yeah. leadership too. And if you convert the leadership exactly. and the building, you can reach a better place. Martin, we're out of time. Thank you so much for this discussion. I would like to do it more with you. I would like to hear more about this. It is a fundamental aspect of our life together in these islands and in the world. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you, Jay. Much appreciated.